Hey everyone, this is uh, Trevor Allen, formerly known as shitty indie wrestler Ryan Stone of Anchors Away. You're listening to Drinking at Moe's. All right, everybody, welcome to Drinking and Mo's. Host Big Mo here. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment on YouTube. Helps of the show. We're on Apple, Google, Spotify. Leave reviews on all them. We're on Anchor, too. They sponsor the podcast. But today I have with me Trevor Allen, the other half of the duo that got me started on independent wrestling. My first ever show, and I told this to Andy a while back, was a Perkins Elementary School fundraiser right before a Tidal Wave show. Yep, I remember those. Those were some fun days. Saw some, uh, there might have been some people on those shows that you see on TV today. There, there are quite a few, actually. <laughs> I, we, I noticed a handful. One of our, I can't remember if it was our first Perkins show, because I think we did three of them. Um, but one of them, we, we had a, Andy, I'm sure he went over this in your podcast, was trained by Rick Drayson. So one of our Perkins shows had a very young gentleman by the name of Johnny Drake at 11 <laughs> years old, who um, you might recognize as a cer- certain boy from the jungle. No shit. <laughs> it was Johnny Drake in the New York knockout Nikki against a gentleman named uh, a little another little kid same age named Gus Doe and uh, Fern Owens. I don't know if you follow Jungle Boy. He posted a picture last week of it was him and uh, Luchasaurus at the training at Rick Drayson's and worked all those guys. One of the guys had a, a shirt that said Team Saint. That was a faction from New Wave Pro Wrestling. I okay. Yeah, that, that, that is something I like. I remember, and I was well. We'll jump right into this, and we'll get into my other um, question that I like to ask a lot of my guests. Some of the people I remember, Lord, I'm try, Correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe this is a Mandela effect thing in my head. <laughs> but I seem to remember. A specific show where it was TJP, Scorpio Sky, and B Boy. Uh huh. Yeah. That oh man, that match has stuck with me for a while. I've been such a huge B Boy fan ever since those days, and you know, seeing you know Scorpio Sky and TJP and all the stuff that they've been mm-hmm. up to since, and you know loving seeing b-boy getting you know back in the swing of things yeah when uh (sighs) here's something funny when we started the new wave pro wrestling school he was the original trainer that we were going to bring in but he was going through so i want to say he had like some knee problems and he actually stepped away from wrestling at the time so it never came to fruition and then a couple years later, he wanted to get back into things. So he, he contacted Andy and I, and he came by the school a bunch of times, but we started booking him on our shows. Um, and I want to be, he was very instrumental and influential in a lot of our shows. I mean, you saw, if you were at um, like our final show, uh, B-Boy After left with fight. the heavyweight title. You know? yeah, I do remember I had to uh, read about the results because I was just getting back from deployment at the time. Okay. So I unfortunately didn't make it. And I, <laughs> I, I joked with Andy about this before that when he, when he heard about me getting back from deployment, he's like, Oh man, I'll, I'll get you a copy of the show. And that was back in that was 2012. 2012. <laughs> I still don't have it. But I, I don't I, have it either. It's okay. And it was my show. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even mad about it. I kind of laugh about it anymore because it's like, hey, you remember when you told me that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's funny. I, 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 I saw your name quite a bit back in those days, but I had no clue who you were. I don't think we crossed paths at all, really, up until the last, you know, six, eight months ish. Um, 
but I remember seeing your name going around and I remember Andy mentioning you, but I had no clue. And it wasn't until, like I said, recently when uh, I uh, caught wind of your podcast uh, through Rick Ellis uh, that um, I was like, oh my gosh, that's the guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. The, the post I did on uh, that event poster that I had that, you know, was, I believe it was a tidal wave show. Mm -hmm. Everybody was signed. I, <laughs> I thought that I had lost it forever. Like I, it had been years since I'd even seen it. Yeah. And then randomly found it. And I still remember that night because I'm like, you know what? I don't think I'm actually going to win the, the raffle. <laughs> so I went and bought one and then wouldn't you know, I end up. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works, man. That's how it always works. Yeah. Oh, God. And I'm sorry. I, I made that poster. And oh, my God. My Photoshop was awful. <laughs> it still is. I'm still learning it. But I, I was trying to put together this big compilation poster. So I tried to include everybody that I could. And yet this was, I, I want to say that was 2011. I want to say mm -hmm. that one was wrong. I think that was Tidal Wave 4. It may, yeah, it might have been. Four or five, I can't remember. Um, and I remember trying to get all these images, and I wanted Lokura and Akira Tozawa to be the biggest ones, since mm. that was our main event. Uh, and man, back then it was hard to find really good graphics from people to put them on posters. So I remember I was making posters, and I'm like, oh man, I could. this is the best quality image I could find, and it looks like crap. Uh, but even then, like just my placement of people on there, Oh man, it is so awful. Uh, I, I remember even some of the guys signing it, you could see like their eyes like, this is a crap poster. Who made this? I should have paid somebody, but man, I was broke. <laughs> <laughs> no, Every it's... single dollar we put, we got from New Wave went into New Wave. It wasn't like there was a whole lot of extra money. Our training school money all went into the shows. Any dollar we made on the show was towards the next show. You know, um, it was very much uh, flying by the seat of our pants and we had no clue what the heck we were doing. <laughs> I, I didn't get into wrestling to be a promoter and here I am, you know, let's see, we started in 20, 2007. I'd been wrestling for three years and I'm now promoting shows and running a school. Come on. You know, looking back on it now, I'm like, Oh God, well, that was the dumbest idea, but it was some of the most fun, man. Like oh, man. seeing, you know, looking where like Rick Ellis is and mm. seeing guys like Ryan kid, uh, and I want to say those are, might be the only two people that came through our school that are still active. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, but yeah, I, I, I loved every moment. God, it was the most stressful. I hate looking back. I'm like, I shouldn't have done it, but at the same time, worth it. <laughs> you, you bring up Ryan kid. Funny thing. That first ever show mm -hmm. I'm sitting there and these two guys come sit next to me. One of them being Ryan kid. Ha. <laughs> And one time they came up and wrestled for now Magnum Wrestling yep. up here. And I told him about that when he came up here. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Was that when he wrestled Tony Cozina? Mm, I'm trying to remember. Okay. But I do remember just having so much fun at those shows. Like, I remember, and I talked to... Uh, Terex about this uh -huh. that the uh the one show that i remember like it happened yesterday was the <laughs> one where he ended up beating the living shit out of ryan kid yeah. did that did that standing those standing moon salts on him and i just remember being like holy sh how the hell is a guy that size doing that Terex is so good oh yeah so and good then, I remember shortly after that show, I brought a friend of mine that was on another ship and there was a couple funny spots because he's like, man, no guardrails. How do you, how do you know when they're coming out? He's like, you, you'll, you'll know, <laughs> you'll know. Like, I just remember one spot. I forget who it was. They were getting ready to dive out. And I'm like, y you might want to move. <laughs> and then, and then I say, you, you're gonna want to watch this guy. And it was Terex, and I'm like, J just watch. And then he, 
is getting ready for another one of those standing mood salts. And my friend just, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, it, and, and that whole thing with him becoming our champion, that was a very last minute deal. I think I might have mentioned this to you when we were chatting on, uh, on Facebook. But, you know, our champion, Lokura, he, he wanted to be done with wrestling. And he was our champion. We had shows coming up, but he was like, I'm done. I don't even want to defend it. Just take strip me and take the belt. You know, I went up to his house and I took it. And Andy and I were just like, what the hell do we do now? Like we had no plan. We had kind of built Lokura up to become the champ. He's the yeah. champ. And like two, three shows in, he's like, yeah, I'm done, guys. You know, we just unmasked him. Something he was very, he wanted to do. He wanted to unmask himself. He had very bad stage fright. So that's why he wore the mask. It helped him actually be out there. But he finally got over that. Was like, I'm ready to unmask. Let's do this. We do all that. And then it's like, yeah, I'm done with wrestling. <laughs> and so we were like racking our brains. And we had brought in um, a, a, a faction called the KOS. I, I remember. And uh, they were from the Empire Wrestling Federation. Uh, Mondo Vega, who, man, I, I, I love Mondo to this day. Uh, Mondo was like the leader of the faction and he was bringing and he wanted to bring it in and do more with it. So we brought him in, we brought some people in, but we wanted to make it a little bit different. We didn't want to do exactly the KOS that was at EWF, which was him, uh, Ryan Taylor, who I believe now wrestles as Taylor Rust, who's another phenomenal mm. talent. And, um, oh, I forget her, I forget her work name. Um, but he, she's referee Marty Elias's daughter, but she was a part of the faction in the EWF. And we kind of brought her and Mondo in, but Russ wasn't a part of it. Or Ryan Taylor, sorry. <laughs> um, and so, but we wanted to do things differently. And they wanted to have like the KOS name was going to be like the the initial, like the, the nickname for each person. So, yeah. you know, Mondo was the king of the streets, but they, we brought in Terex to be his, his big bodyguard guy. And he was the king of size. And then we had Chris Cadillac turn heel. He was the king of speed. And uh, we we gave them all the belts. They had the Cadillac had the rapid title. Terex had the heavyweight title. But him getting the heavyweight title was very much like out of nowhere. So there was a gentleman. He was managing uh, Adam Pierce at the time. Um, uh, C. Edward Vanderpile. I and, yeah. yeah. And I and I called him one day, and I'm just like, Marty, I don't know what to do. Like our champion just quit we have to take the title off of him. We need to give a new champion, but I don't know how to do it. The only thing we had was Ryan Kidd had won a battle Royal in one of the previous shows guaranteeing him a title shot. So we're like, all right, we already know one of the guys in the match is going to be kid. And, and he just, and he just bluntly was like, dude, you've got Terex strap <laughs> him up. And I was like, Oh my God, you're right. And the, the and we, I remember we the next show came and we told Terex we're like all right listen man here's the plan, uh, kid's gonna go out for his match we're gonna play his music everyone knows the KOS music it was Hollywood Undead's Undead mm. song yeah and so just that opening riff would people would be like oh my god and then you so you got Ryan Kid in the ring and at the time he was like 16, 15. Yeah. like this he leg legitimately a child a kid and. Uh, the the KOS music hits and I remember even the audience was like oh and then Terex walks through and it was like oh no I still go back and I'll watch um we have it on the new wave YouTube page it, we still have I think we have the whole match and a highlight video and you could hear the audience just and it wasn't a big show I mean there was probably 20 25 people there it wasn't very big but you could hear the groan yeah and you could hear the groan like oh and you knew and we told him we're like destroy him We'll send people out. We're going to try and get them to stop the match. Like half the locker room, all the baby faces came out. And <laughs> he just kept going moonsault. Because I think that was a show where uh, Mondo wasn't there. The whole KOS wasn't there. It was just Terex. And he just kept moonsault, moonsault, moonsault. We're like, that's what we wanted. We wanted that uncomfortable feeling. I mean, you got this 120-pound kid versus this 300-plus-pound dude. Oh, man. And I, I love the visual from it. I love the visual from it. That's one thing with uh, New Wave, what they had there was definitely those visuals because a lot of, I mean, it's getting somewhat better on independence because there's some independents that are doing some more story-driven stuff. 
sure. instead of the like random, you know, dream match. You go against you and you two against them. Like, I remember talking with SoCal Crazy and the story where he got ran over by a car. <laughs> yep, you hit him with the car. <laughs> Oh my god, I can't believe we hit him with the car. <laughs> yeah. He was he was all in on it. He was all in on it. Ariel Star was in on it. Oh man. Uh it, man, he took a bump off that car. The only thing I wish was we had better lighting because we moved the like mm-hmm. when, we, when the fight went to the outside, the whole audience came out there with us. And I just wish we had better lighting because he took like a like the when Rikishi would take a clothesline and do that spin. Mm-hmm. He did that thing right off the hood of the car and he said he felt fine, but then he got dragged to the ring and beaten. Rotten Ronnie Thrash became our new champ. Mm. Oh man, it was, uh, that was fun. We tried, we tried to do some out of the box stuff with a small indie. You know, I mean, I think our biggest show, our biggest show, we drew like two, 300 people, but the average was a hundred or less, mostly right around the 30 to 50 range. Uh, we tr- but we tried to have fun with it. Like I said, it wasn't, you know, I like to call it, we were a shitty indie. Um, <laughs> you know, we tried to pretend we were bigger than what we were, but looking back on it, we weren't. We were some crummy little indie. The only thing that was different was the guys running it were, we were also on other shows working elsewhere. And that was one of the main reasons we stopped it too, was it was actually hurting our Andes and I bookings. Um, we Numerous times we had to turn down spots because, hey, we had our own show to run and we weren't even on those shows. We took ourselves off. Like two years in, we stopped booking ourselves. It was too hard. Like this sucks. Yeah. I'll run music. Andy will run the back, and yeah, it was too difficult. I, I was I was gonna say I think besides that first tidal wave show that I went to, I think that was really one of the only shows I ever actually saw you guys actually in. I believe yeah. you're in like a battle royal or something. <laughs> yeah, if we did wrestle on any of the shows later on, it was very much, you know, little things like that that we didn't really have to prep for. You know, I, I remember I got a lot of heat. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chimera and Eric Watts. Uh, so Ricardo Rodriguez and Eric Watts were uh, two of our were our tag champs at the time. And one of our title waves, uh, title wave three, that is, was supposed to be me and Andy versus uh, Watts and Chimera. And something happened with Andy and he couldn't make the show. Um and so we were like, well, it, Watson Chimera wanted the belts off them because they're like, listen, we can't make every show. So don't we don't want to be the champs anymore. And we respected that. And the only other team we had was us. And we're like, crap, the promoters have to put the belts on, on themselves. And I, I got I got flack for it that whole night because with Andy not there, I ended up facing them two on one and still beat them. <laughs> and, and even Watson Chimera gave me shit for it. And I'm just like, man, this was your idea. <laughs> but we dropped like as we the very next show we we started building up another team that was training at our school and the show after that we put the titles on them we dropped it to them mm. all we we were just like we just need to get the belts off of these guys onto us and onto somebody else and i think after we dropped the belts we might have wrestled like maybe twice maybe three more times and that was like another two to three years we just I guess it was just so difficult. I don't know how people that run shows and wrestle on them, especially at like a high profile. I don't know how you do it and manage things. Yeah, no, I can imagine that being difficult because not only do you got to worry about, you know, your own match, right? But you got to worry about the whole thing. Like one guy here that, I mean, he's kind of stepped away after some, health issues from the in-ring side of things, but he still runs his shows, uh, Jason Strife, which I... Yeah, I know him, yeah. I'm, yeah. I've am i been looking to get him on, but after his health issues, I'm like, we'll push that back. Sure, But, yeah. I mean, good Lord, when he would do that consistently, it's like, man, that, that's, that's insane, because I know they got one actually this Saturday mm-hmm. where one of my good friends is I'm assuming this match is, a, is the main event. And I still think, I still think he's insane for wanting this, <laughs> but he's, he's like very much death match. Like okay. he loves death matches. 
They even call him the Omaha Deathmatch Daddy. <laughs> he goes like Omaha into Iowa, starting to pick back up, but he's going to have a no rope barbed wire death match. And I'm sitting front row. I've joked with him, man, I'm going to be sitting so close. I'm probably going to be getting blood on me. Probably. <laughs> Maybe a little glass too. <laughs> But wouldn't surprise me. I've actually had a time where I was at a, well, it wasn't a deathmatch show, but there, there was pretty much a deathmatch main event where guy got hit with a light tube. And then not too long later, he got spun around and there I am front row and then blood on my phone. Oh. Blood on my shirt. It was like, I, I kind of laughed at it. I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen too many death matches live. And the one I vividly will remember was XPW when they did their return, uh, Cold Day in Hell. Uh, Jeff Dino and I bought front row tickets. I don't I know why. I the DVD of that show. Oh, do you? It was a fun show. But we were front row for, was it Supreme and Necro Butcher in the main Ooh. event? And oh my god! And even when uh, Chaos and Vampiro, when Vampiro hit him with the the tube of lights all taped together, like it was like six or eight tube. Oh my god, that went everywhere. But watching Vampiro or uh, watching a uh, Necro Butcher and and uh, Supreme do their death match, I was I, I actually got up and left and went to so, sit with the other friends that had different seats because I was like, man, it's a little too much and uh, they're a little too close for my comfort for a death match. I'm going to I'm gonna go sit with my friends over here and another friend of mine who is way into death matches, uh, Matt Twisted, went mm. and took my spot next to, uh, next to Jeff Dino and uh, <laughs> they watched the rest of the show. But yeah, for like the first, every match up until the main, you see me sit in front row with Dino and then I get up and leave and I'm like, yeah, this, I can't do that. Oh, too much. I, one that was actually billed as a death match. Really the only one I've seen so far, probably going to end up seeing another one here soon, was at Wrestling Revolver in Des Moines, mm. Jake Christ. Okay. And that one say Joel Bateman were in a death match. And, like, they had just had a Monsters Ball match right before it. <laughs> and there was, like, they were getting ready to come in and clean up. Because there was like thumbtacks all throughout the ring. And they were in there getting ready to clean up. Before you know it, Jake Chris comes out, steals the mic. It's like, fuck that. Leave it here. Let's go. And, ah, that's oh pretty my. cool. It was insane. The ending, which I actually have um, footage of on my TikTok page for the show, was they bridged two panes of glass on the four Chair, between four chairs uh -huh. and lit them on fire. Oh! <laughs> I was on my feet, jaw on the floor. Oh my gosh. I, I got to wrestle um, a gentleman named Thumbtack Jack uh, out in mm. Germany um, back in 2009. And it was just a regular one-on-one -on -one match. And when I saw who I was going to wrestle, I was like, you want me to wrestle Thumbtack Jack? And I'm a nobody. This dude's got a name. Yeah. I, I only got to wrestle in Germany because uh, Chimera was going over there and he was supposed to have gone about, about eight months earlier, but in a match with me, he broke his leg and I felt awful. Like I even, I felt bad because I was even, we were doing a spot where he wanted to hit me with the unprettier, but he was like, Oh, you'll get me in a waist lock. I'll do a go behind and I'll grab you and do it. And I was like, no man, I'll grab you for a back suplex backflip off of me, grab me in the prettier and hit me with it. Well, when he landed, broke his leg. Oh. I, I felt awful. It was like a week before Christmas and he was oh, supposed no. to go to Germany for a tour like a month later. So when it came back up again uh, after he healed, I told him, I was like, hey, can I come with you? Like, just to, you know, I felt bad. Let, let me go with you so you're not by yourself. Um, and I just said, can I ask one favor? Can you see if they can get me a spot? And I, I got to wrestle three times going there with no uh, you know, uh, the, I had nothing booked, and they I had three matches by the time I landed. It was pretty cool. And nice. but my third one was against Thumbtack Jack. And I remember him telling me the story of lighting glass on fire. At, I think it was a CZW tournament of death. Mm. And he was like, 
not a good idea. It doesn't go out like it does on tables. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but and he was showing me scars he had from the play, and he was and he was like, "Oh, I'm straight edge." So I was like, "Wait, so you're telling me you took zero painkillers?" And he goes, "Oh yeah," and then flew back home to Germany. Like, <laughs> I was like, "Man, you're crazy." Super nice dude. He super cool. I, I that was a pleasure to wrestle the guy. But man, I have a I have a massive respect for the ones who do death matches. I'm not a biggest fan. I think a lot of it is crap, to be quite honest, because you could do it right. Like, I love watching, like, Nick Gage. Mm. I love watching his matches. Uh, we were talking about Alex Cologne. I've watched some of his stuff mm. from GCW. I've loved his stuff. His stuff with, uh, I want to say, I just saw a match recently with him, and I was want to say it was, like, Rina Yamashita. Oh, yes. Um, and, uh, see, I could get behind that stuff. My wife hates all the ex- all the blood. <laughs> I don't mind the blood. What I don't like is when it's just a match of you hitting each other just for mm. the sake of hitting each other. I'm like, yeah, I could have a shitty wrestling match too. You know, uh, yeah, it's not just death matches. It's I just don't think there's much story. And when you could put that behind it and put a story behind it, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. And not not everybody in the death match community could do that. You know, there's a there's a de- death match company in Cali- Southern California that I feel all they do is hit hit each other with stuff. And I'm like, yeah. I, I get what you're trying to do, but go watch the better guys and watch how they set up the spots. Watch how they get into things. Yeah. It's the same thing with wrestling. You see it all the time with the younger generation of talent that do too much, move too quick and all that stuff. And it's, they eventually figure it out. Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's the type of death match. I like, I, you know, I, I like, I'm like, all right, let it make it make sense. And I'm with you. Oh, yeah. No, I am right there with you. Guys like Nick Gage, like Alex Cologne, like John Lane Murdoch, you know, guys that, you know, they fit the weapons and stuff within the story of the mm-hmm. match to where it's yeah. not like, here's a light tube, here's a light tube. And I've seen that way too many times, you know. Or oh, yeah. I've seen people use these massive weapons but then the finish is, I crack you with a light tube and pin you. And I'm like, shouldn't the barbed wire chair have really done that? Not just the light tube? Just saying. You know, build it up. Let's get a big bump at the end. I think Joey Janela was very good at deathmatch stuff. I think his storytelling within that stuff was very well leading up to the big bump. You know? Oh, yeah. And boy, has that man taken some big ones. Oh, my God. I still, I'll never get the one with him and... Um, was it Zandig where they jumped off the, the mm. building onto the truck? Oh yeah. my god, nasty, unnecessary, there, but nasty. <laughs> or there was one that I saw from. Speaking of sick ones, the my friends over there at Warrior Wrestling mm-hmm. had him on one of their shows, one of their stadium series shows. Those are so cool. And he actually takes a dive off a football goalpost. <laughs> it's all about you know, you gotta incorporate that type of stuff i think it's really cool when you do especially at like the stadium shows like work a baseball spot into it if it's at a minor league baseball stadium yeah, but yeah I, i've i've really enjoyed, I, I like those warrior shows i haven't seen too many of them but i've seen clips of the stadium stuff and it looks like a really cool setup i actually got invited out to when they went down to St. Louis. Okay. And I got to be a part of their fan fest. I got, I, I, I remember this because the impression of these two stuck with me when Uemura and Conklin from uh, New Japan, mm, yeah, they, they fought each other on the show. But before the fan fest started, when they came in, they were the first two that literally went around shook everybody's hand and introduced themselves to everybody yeah and i remember them coming up to me i'm like hi <laughs> I'm uh, not... <laughs> like i'm i'm i i literally i hadn't even had my podcast going for that long and here i am <laughs> meeting those guys from new japan i'm like hi <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's weird when you get into those situations. I um I got to work at a show. I don't know if you if you heard about this, but there was a fan convention up in San Francisco back in 2007 called Wrestle Fan Fest. 
Mm. And it's historical, not because it was good, because it was three days of a clusterfuck. Oh, and it was at the it was at the Cow Palace in San Francisco. Oh boy. I was lucky enough to even be like I got into the Battle Royal. I got to work um a, a Sunday matinee show there. So I'm like, hey, I got to check off. I wrestled at the Cow Palace on my bucket list. But sitting in that locker room and I look to the left and I'm like, oh cool, it's Steve Carino, it's Abyss. Oh, hi uh Ultimo Dragon and and, and all these, and I'm just like this is insane. I, I, I don't, I shouldn't be here. This isn't, this isn't my level. And here I am, you know, and I, I took up a talk with Steve Carino because um, one of my trainers was the Colorado kid, Mike Rapata. And him and Carino actually teamed up a lot in, I want to say China. And so I got to go up to Carino and I just said, Hey, you know, one of my trainers had a lot of stories about you. And I told him who it was. And he goes, the Colorado kid. And, and, you know, and, and the first question he asked me and, and was like, okay, does Mike have an obsession with birds? And I cracked up because I remember the first time I walked up, I walked into Mike's house to the first day I ever trained in his ring, bird cages everywhere, garage. No, no cars, birds in bird cages. There's times where we would get to the ring before he was ready. So we'd mess around in the ring, but he would be upstairs in his, this is in his backyard. He'd be upstairs in the shower and we could hear him. And I remember one time we came down and we're like, Mike, were you singing to a bird in the shower? And he goes, oh, yeah, I take a shower with one of my birds. He likes getting in the shower. Mike is just was obsessed with birds. And I just found it funny that Karina was like, the first, only thing he asked me was, is Mike obsessed with birds? Every day he'd go bird watching and all this. And I'm like, yeah, man, the guy even has pigeons in, in cages. Like, he loves birds. <laughs> But yeah, but yeah, sitting there when you get those guys coming up to you and, you know, you're talking to them and I'm just like, whoa, this is pretty cool. You know, Sonny's there, Sandman's there. All these guys are there. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, no, so. I, I definitely felt uh, like you mentioned with you there. I definitely felt a little like out of my league, I guess, mm -hmm. for a better way sure. of putting it at the time. Like, I feel more confident now. To right. where I probably would have done a little better with it. But, <laughs> I mean, good Lord, like sitting right across the aisle from me at the fan fest was Mike Bennett. Mm -hmm. Then there was just down the aisle to my left was uh, Lance Archer, Jeff oh, Cobb, Jonah, nice. Athena, and like. I just remember thinking to myself, holy shit. <laughs> and I actually got to talk with, it was one of my shorter episodes, but I actually got to talk with Jonah for this. Like, I just remember walking up to him like, hey, um, you wouldn't mind talking to me for my show. <laughs> I remember being so damn nervous. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's weird when you, when you come across these guys and, you know, whether they're people you've watched on TV since you were children or just now, like, you know, I've, um, I, I've been uh, good friends with a lot of people throughout my, my time. And, you know, I recently got to go to a house show here in Colorado uh, with my family and I took my kids, they, my, my kids have never seen a wrestling show. And my wife uh, works with some folks that love wrestling. So we, we, we brought them to, um, we bought tickets, all eight of us went. They, it was, it was uh, me, my wife, my kids, my, my wife's coworker, his wife and his kids. Um, and his son, who I want to say is like 19, just absolutely loves wrestling. And I, I felt bad because in the intermission, I went up to the, um, where they have all the sound stuff. And I went to go say hi to Adam Pierce. I hadn't seen him in years. Um, and I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call him, you know, a close friend, but car rides together, drove him up to LA. He lived one exit south of me in San Diego. So we were on a lot of shows together and we know each other. He's met my wife. We knew him and all that stuff. But I kind of felt bad going like, oh, hey, I'm going to go talk to a buddy of mine. If you got, and I didn't want to bring them with me. But when we came back, they're like, oh, who'd you go see? And I was like, oh, our, my friend Adam over there. They're like, Adam Pierce. You're friends with Adam Pierce. I'm like, yeah, I knew him through wrestling. I haven't seen him in like eight, nine years. And they're just like, and just the, the, the looks on their faces were like, oh my gosh, 
And here I am going, well, I mean, I'm hanging out. I've hung out with Adam, you know, outside of wrestling, inside of wrestling. Like, but then it's like, you see what these people are just like, oh my God, Adam Pierce. And I'm just like, man, that's pretty cool. I, 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 I like, I love watching those reactions of people when when they see people and stuff. I like, I still remember the time I, I met Bret Hart in an elevator and I was still wrestling at the time. I was, uh, we were at going to a WrestleMania and we just happened to, my wife and I stayed at the hotel that the WWE crew was at. Doors open, there's Bret Hart. And immediately I'm like, oh, you know, here I am. I've been wrestling at this point for like 10 years. I should have be awestruck. Nope, starstruck right away. You know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, there's definitely, I'd say that I don't get too starstruck, but like I mentioned in a tweet of mine recently after, you know, a certain person liking one about an episode, I'm still freaking out about that. That's pretty cool, man. I got to admit but, that's pretty damn cool. But like Stone Cold Steve Austin would be one that I don't know if I'd be able to get a word out. And the guy that liked the tweet, Bray <laughs> Wyatt. Yeah. Like I remember I specifically – message dutch who the episode was about i'm like um dude uh do you know bray wyatt because he just liked a tweet about your episode of my show and he wasn't even tagged in it he was <laughs> so like, he oh that. yeah oh he's like oh yeah he's a good buddy of mine i'm like no shit <laughs> and you know what finding those connections pe- through people you know i mean that's how a lot of stuff happens I got to wrestle for Ring of Honor all because of Adam Pierce. That is, we uh, Andy and I went to uh, WrestleMania 26 in Arizona. Uh, they did Friday Saturday shows for <laughs> Ring of Honor. Friday night we bought tickets. We went and you know we saw Adam hanging out kind of way behind the crowd, so he's not noticed. And we're like, and I you know I told my wife I was like, hey, I'm gonna go go say hi to Adam with Andy. And we went and said hi, and we're bullshitting for about 30 seconds, and then he just looks at both of us. You got your gear on you. And I'll admit, Andy, and the best part was Andy knew the answer to this. His eyes widened up, but he didn't say a word. All he did was deadpan to me because he knew, nope, I didn't. I broke rule number one, and I have a very good fucking reason for it. Uh, <laughs> I left my gear at home. And so uh, Adam is just berating me, like, really, man? Like, come on. And I just looked at him and I said, Adam, I texted you like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Hey, I'm going to be there. Is there any chance I could help out, get a dark, whatever? And you told me to go fuck myself <laughs> in the nicest way possible. But he literally said, go fuck yourself um, or fuck off one of the two. But I what? knew what he meant. It wasn't like him being pissed at me. It was just like, bro, come on. Um, and, and he laughs and he goes, you still should have brought your fucking gear. I'm like, yeah, I know. But I ended up, because we wore Navy fatigues, I went to an Army Navy store that next morning and bought stuff, bought some boots. I didn't even have my wrestling boots, nothing. And we went and did the show, but that was the only way I was able. I got to work Ring of Honor. I didn't give a shit. I was going to spend whatever I could. I almost drove back from Phoenix to San Diego with Andy, get my gear, and then drive back to Phoenix Friday night. That's how, like, we were like, oh, shit, how are we going to do this? Um, but yeah, um, Andy was just looking at me just like, you idiot. <laughs> but then again, and if Andy ever tells you, uh, I remember when he told me he brought his gear to the sh- he brought his gear to Phoenix. I was like, "Why'd you bring your gear?" He goes, "The money in the bank match, man. They might have an opening." And I was just like, "You're an idiot." But here we are. He was the smart one. He had his gear. He looked perfect. He looked good. And fuck it, we got to do a dark for Ring of Honor, and I was like, "Oh man!" And here I am in some. I didn't even match with him. I didn't even have my wrestling boots on. The belt I had broke ten minutes, like five minutes into the match. I'm like, oh, oh this is awful. <laughs> oh, but I got to do it, and it's on video, and I have pictures. That's all I care about. That that is awesome. And I mean, before we get into one other thing, I was wanting to talk about because we have this in common too. But you bring up Ring of Honor. One of my first episodes on zoom actually two of my first episode on zoom were with two people that have been associated with ring of honor in one capacity or another at different times the sats oh yeah they were my first one 
And then I remember Carrie Silken. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I remember when I reached out to him, I'm like, I'm not even going to lie. I've lost kind of how many times I said this to different wrestlers trying to get them for the show. And I'm like, I know this might be a long shot, (laughs) but here. And basically, he he told me that Tony Khan didn't want, didn't usually like his people um, going on random podcasts, but he had already told me he was going to do mine, so just don't advertise it beforehand. Gotcha. So I got to gotcha. do that. But uh, I can see in the baggie for, you know, people that watch the YouTube video, you and I both have a... Uh, bit of a collecting bug oh yeah i uh i i um oh camera switched i gotta move this way i collect championship belts i got a bunch over there i've got uh i got a bunch on the floor that i don't have i don't have a. Mm. I don't have a case for it yet i gotta get one i wish i had a mobile camera so i'm gonna see if i could at least just turn the monitor and you could see the mess uh, this is all unopened. I have oh. an entire wall just of unopened action figures. I haven't opened any of mine. <laughs> I uh, I plan on opening them once I get my situation. I, I say that I've lived in this house for almost three years and I haven't done it yet. For three <laughs> years, I've had these boxes over here to my right. And it, it's, it's, it's awful. I mean, shoot, I even have, they're even on my desk. You know, I, mean, um, I got I got a couple with me right now. Some of them I I'll, I'll never open because I mean I got them signed, including oh, absolutely Hangman Adam. Oh, Hay- that's a good one. Um, that was the first one I ever got signed, and this one I actually just picked up. The oh, other day. yes, NWO Madness. I love that one. One I'm like, hmm, and then. Me being the Stone Cold fan. <laughs> those Ultimates that they put out are so good. So good. The quality on those. I actually, I like the Mattels over the Jazzwares AEW figures. Uh, I find them just to be a little bit better of a build. I recently, uh, I, I, I want to, gosh, again, I, my, my memory is not very great. I want to say you, we were talking about that Target Sammy Guevara mm. figure. Yeah, so I found one because I have I've only ever opened up the very first AEW series. So I haven't opened up a single box since. And so I was like, so I bought two of these and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna open up one, I'm gonna see how it feels, and I'll and I'm messing with it. And I'm like, oh, it's not bad. I like the Mattel ones better. You know, I got like a Mattel Sammy here, and I'm like, I I like these so much better. Um I think the 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 quality, the feel, sometimes I, I like the bendability of some of mm. these guys. But there's some of them where I'm just like, ah, I, I wish it was a little more rigid. Uh, but I absolutely love. Man, I've been collecting action w like wrestling figures since '91, and I've got uh, in my unfinished basement. I've got uh, boxes of Hasbro's, the Jack set. I've got all the like most of the bone crunching action sets. Um, mm. I, I I I love wrestling figures. I collect them all the time. Um, I pretty much have every AEW set has ever dropped. I've got it sitting over here. Um, nice. Yeah, that was one of the things that I wanted to get on when when they when they went live and I was a fan and I became a fan. That was one of the things I was telling my wife. I'm like, I want the sets. Uh, I want the whole set. Like I said, the only other thing I ever want to do is I want to get the full Hasbro WWF sets. Mm. Um, but the AEW ones, I want. That's the only current ones. I'm really trying to collect every single one on. And I got all of them except for a couple of like box sets. I don't think I, I don't have the Jurassic Express ones. Mm. Um, the the Cody Rhodes and the uh, Dustin. The Blood Brothers. I don't have that one either. Those are the only two that I do not have. Every other set I've got where it's on pre-order right now. Oh dang! <laughs> I I hated it. I went to Double or Nothing this year and. We, my wife and I were in the hotel ready to leave and I'm on my phone doing stuff. And she's like, what happened? I'm like, fan, we didn't go to the fan fest. And I was like, fan fest just happened. And she goes, what does that mean? I'm like, there's like five new sets for pre-order. I need like 10 minutes. <laughs> and so she's just like, 
fine, I'll wait. And I'm sitting there on my phone, you know, <laughs> trying to pre-order these things. <laughs> I think the only one of the AEW ones that I'm like, I'm not really a completist, <laughs> but there is one series that I do have all but like three of them. And they there's a pretty good deal on the ring set. I might end up thinking about it here soon. But it's the one with uh, Lance Archer. Yeah. And I don't have the the Young Bucks and Nyla Rose of that. Okay. Other than that, I have all the other ones. <laughs> and, oh, God. Yeah, no, that's... And a couple of the WWE elites, I have probably about half mm-hmm. of the... Uh, of a couple different series of those I'm wanting to say the one with uh, Bronson Reed okay I have about half of that one and he's got the Bam Bam gear in that one doesn't he yeah the Bam Bam gear oh I love that thing I haven't got that one yet but that one's awesome that one that one's actually a pretty good deal on ringside yeah but man and you bring up the title belts behind you. That's one thing I, I want. I want to get one, but good lord, they're so damn expensive. I, I uh, yeah, I, I love title belts. It's something that I've always wanted to get into, and you know, we finally got to a place where I can actually get into that hobby. Um, you know, am I proud to say it? Now, those two new that side, those two new Japan ones are bootleg. You know, mm. is what it is. I couldn't get the I couldn't get the re, the official ones. Um, I just couldn't swing it at the time. But those that one, and I have a winged eagle. That's a bootleg. That was actually the first belt I got. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm trying to go official with most stuff. I, I you know, uh, I remember like when the AEW World Title dropped. I just looked at the wife. I'm like, I need I need this. <laughs> I need this. And I, I forget what she what excuse she used. She's like, yeah, it's our anniversary. Or, I forget mm-hmm. when it came out, but oh man, that that that's the best replica belt I've ever seen. Um, and now they got the TNT titles up for pre-order. I'm just like, oh my gosh! I, th- I think they go off pre-order tomorrow, and I'm like, uh, I haven't ordered it yet. Um, yeah. But you know, if they would let me use my stupid 10% off from the All Elite crate, I would like to. <laughs> but nope. No. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love belts. I, I've been a big belt mark. I mean, the Winged Eagle is, the, in my opinion, the GOAT belt. Um, and the oh. V4 IWGP is probably my mm. number two. Um, and then, uh, see, I'm, I'm so backed up. The I keep leaning the wrong way. Uh, the the World Heavyweight title, the the big gold. That's my third. I, 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 I love those belts. Um, yeah. It, you bring up an... We talked about uh, Alex Colon earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, I I collect figures and then different autographed items, and I love right. getting autographed stuff from people I've had on the show. He was – I actually have some of his uh, kick pads, signed oh, ring nice. kick pads that I'm yeah. – I found a picture of him in a match about to go, like – threw a pane of glass with them on and I'm like I want so bad to just get those kick pads framed with that picture in there with That's them cool. yeah but man <laughs> so like I got I've actually started when I've been able to meet different wrestlers multiple times getting one time getting a picture with them then the next time I find out I'm getting to meet them I get an eight by ten made of it and give them the sign. Nice, nice. I've done that with Mike Bennett and Rich Swan. Okay. Met. I've actually now met Mike Bennett about three times in the last year. Once up in here in Omaha, once down in St. Louis, and then most recently out in Des Moines for Revolver Sammy Callahan's promotion. And I remember I walked up to him. We were talking, and before we started talking, I'm like, "Man, we gotta quit meeting up like this." <laughs> but yeah, man. Oh, like I said, 
my like I guess holy grail item I don't really I mean I have some like ultimate ones that I'd love to get for um title belts Mm -hmm. but in reality it wouldn't really matter which company I got one from but me being the big stone cold fan that I am if I I swear if I got my hands on that smoking skull belt, I'd... <laughs> that's, that's a pretty nice one. Yeah. Uh, I, th- that's, if you're a stone cold Mark, absolutely. And I use the word, I, I don't know. I use the word Mark in a very, I don't consider it a bad word. I'm a Mark. Oh, yeah. I, uh, uh, I even had a, somebody tweeted me a, a former, a former student. Um, he works with uh, Rick Ellis quite a bit, uh, Adam mm-hmm. Jones. He, he had tweeted something about uh, how something I had taught him or told him 15 years ago about the word Mark and stuff and how, how it's not derogatory. And, and if you use it in a derogatory way, it's kind of shitty on you. And, and, uh, and, I, and I agree with it. You know, it's something I definitely believe in. I don't think the word Mark should be. I think the biggest Marks in wrestling are the guys who got involved in it. I consider yeah. myself one of the biggest Marks. I went and did it for a decade. You know, I <laughs> spent my own money to travel to shows to wrestle on them to make 10 bucks, you know, um, it, it, I find the, the, the people in the business are the biggest marks of them all. So I don't use it in a bad way, but absolutely as a stone cold mark, that's an absolute belt that I think would be a uh, bucket list material. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Like I know, uh, I mean, you bring up the term mark. There's definitely those that in the business that definitely use it in a, more derogatory yeah. way it's like saying like oh you're just a mark i'm like well you every like vast majority if not everybody that actively wrestles you started off being a fan yep. a mark yep so you to say that somebody that's paying their money to see whoever the hell just a mark it's like and saying it in a derogatory way i'm like really you can't remember a time when you were their age or just getting started out where you were a mark for somebody i miss the days back when i was a mark you know what i'm saying like getting into wrestling really ruined a lot of things and ruins not really the right word either, but I guess kind of is as well because it didn't ruin wrestling for me. I just have a different perspective when I watch it. Uh, not being, I haven't had a match since 2017 and I haven't been really active in wrestling since 20 in the, the uh, October of 2014. And, you know, watching wrestling now has really kind of reenacted my fandom. There's mm. a, I feel a lot different than I did for wrestling when I was active in it. When I was active in it, I really didn't get too excited about things. You know, it was very different feeling. And, and man, I missed it. You know, I missed the days where I had to rush home from school because it was Monday night and Raw and Nitro were starting yeah. here soon. You know, I missed those days. I When I went to that house show and I said, you know, the people that, that my wife uh, got tickets for, they're absolute fans, never got involved. I'm just watching them watch the show. Man, I love watching that part of it. I love watching wrestling through other people's eyes. You know, like my wife, even though I've smartened her up to a lot of stuff, there's a lot of stuff I don't tell her because I tell her, I'm like, listen, I could tell you some of the inside things or the things that run through my brain, but it might ruin something for you. You know, I, you know, I remember I did, I did that once where I told her something inside and I was just like, Hey, this is going to happen because they just did X, Y, and Z. And then it happens. And she goes, don't do that. I want to be surprised. And I, and I stopped, you know, I, she even tells me, she goes, I don't even want you predicting shit. Even if you're, um, even if you're like not guessing because, oh, you're seeing the writing on the wall, you know, you're just guessing. She goes, I don't even want you to do that because you're right half the time. (laughs) And, uh, but I, I love watching wrestling through those eyes because man, those were the days. Like Mm. once you get involved with wrestling and you kind of know the ins and the outs and stuff, it does change the way you watch it. So being able to watch somebody react to things in that manner, my God, it, it's one of the coolest things. So man, calling somebody a mark in a derogatory term, man, like you said, you were once there. You are now crapping on the people that you evolved from, you know? And it's like, man, 
it's not it's not a derogatory term. I hate when it's used that way. Uh, I, I mean, hell, just go on Twitter. I hate wrestling Twitter. Wrestling Twitter is nope. the absolute worst. Oh, you sure uh, can. The tribalism between AEW and WWE fans today is. Oh, God. Yeah. I didn't watch WWE for two and a half years, uh, probably 2020 until WrestleMania of this year, almost. Um, and it wasn't because I had some AEW fandom that was, I just didn't care for the product. My mm-hmm. wife loves Cody Rhodes. Like, <laughs> this, she started watching wrestling in 2002. Her favorites are John Cena. Randy Orton and Cody Rhodes. And so when Cody went back, she was like, well, we have to watch WWE now. And so we started watching it again. And, you know, I was like, oh, there's things I like, things I dislike. But for the most part, if I'm doing this through most of your show, why, why am I going to spend three hours watching it every week? You know, mm-hmm. so I stopped watching and, you know, I've gotten back into watching WWE, but uh, like, I still don't get that tribalism, man. I'm like, you can enjoy both. Like, imagine oh, yeah. Twitter was around in the late 90s. Oh, God. Yeah, like, that would have been horrible. I want to see it, but at the same time, I'm so happy it wasn't. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> like, I've said it so many times. It's like, really, just let yourself sit back and just let the show go. Yeah. Let Just enjoy it. Like, like you, I had kind of not really fully gotten away from the wwe product but you know it actually oh when was it it was not all that long ago now my wife had surprised me with tickets to smackdown Mm -hmm. they were coming to omaha and i was like i had thought about getting tickets for myself but then i'm like "Eh, i don't know right and then I'm literally on my way home from work and she sends me this ticket master link on a text. I'm like, what's this? <laughs> it's like, Smackdown. I'm like, what? She's like, oh, yeah, you're going with your friend. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and man, ever since, like, I don't know. I just, I let myself sit back and just enjoy it. And, yes. you know, right now, there is like not just AEW and WWE. I mean, no. you go you go through and there's so many independent promotions being given exposure through Fight TV, IWTV, Pro Wrestling TV. Um, you go Impact's got Impact Plus, New Japan's got their thing. Like if you don't like one thing, you can just flip through something. You can find another, there's or else so you're much. just not a fan to begin with if you can't find something right now right and that was the other thing i think a lot of people and i saw this a lot on indie wrestling where because in my opinion the best kind of shows are the shows that every fan can get some type of enjoyment out of Mm -hmm. you like female wrestling hey we should have a match or two of female wrestling you like tag teams you like singles you like hardcore you like cruiserweight style the indie style you should have a mix and a flow of those types of matches throughout an indie show. And so you absolutely should be able to find something, but like you hit it on the head, man. impact is putting out quality stuff right now. Mm-hmm. Like, the, the fact that they don't have more eyeballs on them is a shame. Yeah. They I... are killing it. You know, you got GCW when they did the Hammerstein, Holy shit. That got my, on my wife's radar and she doesn't know shit about GCW. I have a GCW beanie now because of it. Uh, we started watching some of the GCW shows on Fight. Um, you know, we had we had an IWTV subscription for a little bit. You know, so checking out some of like the AIW stuff. We were watching when um, this is a while. This is when Beyond Wrestling. I want to say it was season two of Uncharted Territory. So like every Tuesday, we were watching Uncharted or Wednesday. I forget the date it was on. We were watching the Uncharted Territory stuff. Uh, I remember we, I showed her American Rana. And it was the it was the last match. This is when Joey Janela and David Starr, um, I think, was the main event. And then mm. we watched another one where they did their no rope barbed wire death match. Oh. Um, and uh, you know, she's seen these people. She has no clue who any of these folks were. And sure, I mean, David Starr, good riddance. Um, but yeah, they're uh, 
there's so much out there. Like you said, if you can't find something out of what's available, you're not a fan, man. Just yeah. go away. You know, I, uh, and that was, that's another thing that, that I, that really turned me off and it really turned me off to Twitter kind of in general. I st- I'm on there, but it's hard for me to read stuff. I hate when I would see people, and these are even friends of mine that would do this every Monday and every Friday, they're live tweeting raw and SmackDown mm. or yeah, Monday and Friday now. But every tweet is negative. Yeah. Like, why are you watching this? You obviously have no, you don't care. It's not yeah. good to you. You're putting your, you're torturing yourself. Go watch something you enjoy. If I don't mm-hmm. like something, I'm not going to watch it. I'm not a big fan of scary movies. The horror genre, it's just, it does nothing for me. Yeah. So instead of saying all horror movies are shit, no, I just don't watch it. I'm not a country music fan. Is all country music shit? No, it's not to the fans. So why why does my opinion matter over anybody else's? It doesn't. It's And this is the best thing. It's subjective. And that's what exactly. I love about wrestling is how subjective it is. You know, uh, the, the, uh, the podcast I should, haven't done in a while, uh, <laughs> the podcast that I do, me and my buddy uh, Badger, him and I, we, we grew up watching wrestling together. We've been friends since we were 11 years old, watching everything together. Everything. We discovered ECW together. We discovered Japan together. Uh, we watched everything together. And we have two different views of what we like of our, in, our, in our wrestling. He's got a much different view than me. But neither of us are incorrect. If I sat there and said, Shawn Michaels is the greatest wrestler of all time, and he looks at me and goes, no, it's Chris Jericho. I mean, really, neither of us are wrong in our opinions. It's just your personal, per, again, again, personal opinion. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's what I love about wrestling. It's art, music, movies, all of that stuff. You don't have to like this one piece to like wrestling. You could hate WWE, but love everything else. Hey, you could hate everything about today's wrestling, but love Mid-South and just watch nothing but Mid-South. You know, um, there's a, a couple of Google Drives that I had to pick up, uh, Chris P. Lettuce and the WCW Deep Cuts. You know, the Chris P. Lettuce one, it's a lot of territorial stuff. That's not my that's not my jam. I'm not way into that stuff. Now the WCW deep cut stuff, <laughs> I'm I'm scouring that. And I'll, and it's uh I'm trying to find this. I can't remember if it was a, a WCW Worldwide or WCW Saturday night. But there this was the moment where I'm like, I think I could do this. I was probably seven, eight, nine years old when I saw this. And there was a, a, a job guy on there, and his name was Trevor Allen. I saw that and was like, I'm going to go fucking be a wrestler. Just watch. <laughs> All because of some job guy had the exact same name as me. It could have been a fake name. It could have been his real name. I don't know. I haven't found that clip, and I'm still in my head going, okay, I know there was a Trevor Allen. I got to find it. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, man, like I go to the WCW Deep Cuts. I love watching um, – the old like superstars of wrestling from like the early nineties, back when I was a kid, you know, and I was seven, eight, nine, ten years old watching this shit. And I go back and watch that stuff. I love today's wrestling. And I think today's wrestling is some of the best ever. Oh I yeah. Think we're getting, we, I think today we have the best, the best in ring performers of any generation today. I, um, I would have to agree. I mean, you, just look at some of the guys that are out there you know the guys still going the Samoa Joes AJ oh Styles I mean Jericho uh Hangman Adam Page and you know hopefully all goes well with his I'm recovery hoping. from that, that nap. was rough that was oh, rough to watch I remember watching it and all of a sudden the match stops and I'm like what the hell and then they start you see how shook up some of the people were around there and I'm like, yeah. Oh boy. They, they, ain't, they ain't shitting around here. Something happened. Yeah. I, uh, we don't have cable. Um, I, I may use a VPN and access fight TV for all the AEW shows. Hey, at least I'm paying for it. Um, <laughs> I got two TV. There you go. I, 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 uh, so I, I can't, I don't watch So I watch raw on Tuesdays on Hulu and so on Tuesday night, you know, we're, we're all eating dinner and we had raw on whatever. And my wife and I, had, you know, kids get put to bed and we're like, okay, now we're going to put on AEW. And I'm kind of scrolling through Twitter real quick. And I'm like, why did Big E say prayers for hangman? 
Yeah. And then I start looking and, I, and my wife and I were just about to start the show and I'm like, Hangman got hurt. Holy shit. And I saw the, I saw the gif of it and I'm like, yeah. Oh my God. I showed it to the wife and I'm like, he smacked his head on that bump and it could have been the line. It could, the line could have given him whiplash and, and taken him yeah. out. And then he I, numbed. Yes. Oh my God. But the fact that the way he landed looked, looked harsh, man. And, yeah. and I even looked at the wife. I was like, look at all the crazy shit he does. He does routine moonsaults to the outside, you know, off the top rope, not just like off the apron or something, just stand top rope. He does all this shit. A clothesline took him out. Yeah. So, I compressed my spine taking a suplex. Yeah. Like, I, it's the littlest things. Like, like Chimera broke his leg just because I gave him a backflip off of me. Like it's the tiniest stuff that I've seen people get hurt, but yet this guy does, you know, uh, you know except for Jack Evans, the time he I, I saw him do a corkscrew 630 and he landed on his head. Oh my God, that was nasty. But like most of the times those guys land safe and I'm like, yeah, it's the tiniest little things is what hurts people. I watched one of the Ballard brothers blow out his knee. What did he do? He got thrown through the middle rope to the outside of the floor and landed awkwardly. It's just the tiniest stuff that just gets you yeah. Man, I, it, it's it was it's rough to see. Man, I'm hoping he can come back. I'm hoping it's it's not like something major. Um, hey, and, I think man, they... it was so cool to see how well they took care of him. Oh yeah, getting out of the ring, getting him on the stretcher, like that is what that uh, I forget the guy's name now. That was that got uh, the concussion in the NFL a couple weeks ago. That's how he should have been taken care of. <laughs> oh, the the Miami quarterback. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I remember, I think they released that, you know, it seems weird in this this sense to say that it was just a concussion. But I guess thankful to say that it indeed was just a concussion and not something, you know, like a broken neck or something. Exactly. Exactly. I mean... It, yeah, it, it, it's not weird. It's like, oh yeah, it's okay. He just broke his foot. That still sucks. But <laughs> yeah, and especially with everything we know about concussions, like I, I was even telling my wife not too long ago, I'm like, I, I don't know how many I might have had. I said I could remember one where I legit was like, oh my god, I remember I took a bump, and I was, it was taking that the crossroads Cody's finish, mm. and I was like, man, I'm gonna make this look so cool. I'm gonna have my legs up in the air when we come around. Yeah, I didn't protect myself, and I went straight down on my forehead. Flash a white light, and I roll over, and I, you know, the guy covers me. And I kick out, and the referee, his name's uh, Justin Borden. He looks at me, and uh, and he goes, and he goes, "You okay?" I was like, "Justin, I hit my head." And he goes, "You okay?" And I'm like, "I think so." He goes, "Where are you?" Covina. Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> and I was. I, I had a headache later on, but it wasn't anything major. Probably something mild, but I hit my head. And flash a white light. I mean, it wasn't like I closed my eyes, it was just a big blur. And, you know, nothing got knocked out. But then there was a time where Andy and I were wrestling and he got knocked unconscious during the match. Ooh. And it was what well, the scariest part was I, I remember they, so I, when I saw him take the bump, I was like, ooh, that looked rough. And I went and I broke up the pin and I asked our opponent, I was like, is he okay? And he goes, no, he's out. I grabbed him and I dragged him to my corner and I tagged myself in. And mm. by that point, he was already up. Um, he was up, he was coherent and eyes were open by the time I was dragging him. So I was like, I knew he was fine. Well, as good as he could be. Yeah. I mean, the fact that he was unconscious for two seconds, uh, was enough, but if I didn't break up the pin, we would have lost at that moment. Uh, I think we lost the match anyway. So whatever, <laughs> uh, should have just let him pin him because we saw it. We still went on for another little bit, but I remember I, I dragged him over and I tagged him in and he goes, what's up? And I'm like, dude, you got knocked out. Get out of the ring now stay out of the ring. And I was just going to finish the match two on one. Yeah. And so I'm doing something. I, I cut them off. I'm putting some heat on them and I turn around and Andy's just standing in the ring looking at me and starts calling spots. And I'm like, bro, get out of the fucking ring. Like, and we get to the back, the match is over. We get to the back and we had, this was an afternoon show. We were supposed to be wrestling that night on another show mm. uh, in LA. And he's just like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm like, we're not doing the fucking show. He was like, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm like, you were unconscious. Just not doing it. <laughs> yeah. And I remember we, we, we got undressed, we got in the car, we're driving to the next show, 
And uh, Andy's like, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm like, no, we're going there. We're telling them we ain't doing the fucking show. And I'll tell them, I was like, listen, and, and I just got over uh, uh, my, I hurt my knee like six weeks prior and I just got no, and I was kind of just coming back. So I'm like, I'm not ready for a singles match. And uh, we, we stopped to grab some food and he couldn't keep anything down. And it was mm. at that moment, he's finally like, yeah, I probably should have wrestled. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Went to the place, told him, hey, listen, Andy got knocked out today uh, in an earlier match. We can't do it. They tried to get me to do singles, and I'm like, I appreciate it, guys, but I'm just getting over a knee injury. I'm not 100% either. Uh, and we, we, but man, the thing is, people really don't, weren't looking at concussions. This was probably 2010, maybe 2011. Mm. And so the concussions were a thing, but it wasn't, you know, People were probably wrestling on him, you know, that night and not even thinking twice. And even the guys at the show were still like, oh, I'm sure you're fine. Just limit your bumps. And I'm like, no, no, no. no. You know, this is already post Benoit. We know a lot more than what, what a lot of people did. And yeah, man, concussions, no joke. Don't, yeah. I don't mess with them. Um, yeah, I want to mess today, around with them. Even today, like um, my children go to school. If they hit their head in school, it doesn't even have to. It could just be like a, a t- you know, just a little bonk on a on a chair. They have to see the nurse. The nurse has to notify the parent, and then they have to send home a report to the parents. Mm. Like just a small hit to the head is being noticed in elementary schools. So yeah. I'm like, yeah, you should be paying attention to head injuries. Oh, definitely. Um, what one thing I like to round off sure my episodes with. Well, two things. I got two different categories. One bit of a name game. I name off some people, and you give me your thoughts on them. Absolutely. First one, SoCal Crazy. Oh, man. You got to give me the best one first. I, I my, figured. I, I that's, started that's, my, that's my fucking brother, man. Uh, for those that, that will watch on YouTube. Mm. there's SoCal crazy tattooed on me permanently myself SoCal and Andy all got this tattoo together uh I can't remember the year but so when we when Andy and I were breaking in as a tag team um we weren't getting any notice the guy Mike Rapata didn't have the greatest name in SoCal and it wasn't because he was bad it was because of the shows he put on he was he was doing more kid stuff like he had me dress up as like Mr. Incredible to do a show Mm -hmm. uh I dressed up as Cartman once to do a show I did a pirate gimmick it was very much kid oriented yeah. And so no one took them seriously. We were called the Southwestern Alliance of Wrestling. That was our, our promotion name. And uh, I was the very first match on the very first show. And uh, and that was my very first match. And so that's where I met SoCal Crazy. Um, and when Andy and I broke away from Rapata, we start, that's when Anchors Away started. Uh, we were towing, towing around with it uh, before we left Mike. And then we were finally like, Listen, if we want to really try and have a go on the SoCal Indies, we got to go do this. Well, anyway, SoCal Crazy and Matt Twisted started teaming up a little bit. And Matt Twisted's into the deathmatch stuff. So Twisted is the barbed wire representation uh-huh. here. Sailor hat for anchors away. SoCal's mask. And uh, Twisted never got the tattoo. It's all good. He's a part of it, man. Um, but SoCal Crazy, I know I, I know his quick thoughts, but fucking love that guy. He... Uh, he, he's my fucking brother. I'm so happy he made it through cancer. Um, like, I can't wait to see his show. I will be watching. I won't be there, but I'll be watching because uh, he's going to live stream it on uh, I'll Find A Way. <laughs> um, I, he's actually using my uh, my show's Facebook page for Facebook Live for it. Sweet. I know uh, one of the guys has just set up a Roku channel for SoCal Wrestling. Yes. Uh, uh, his name's John. He's also a fucking great guy. Um and so, yeah, I, I can't wait to watch it. Uh, it's, uh, man, I, I love that dude. I can't wait to see him back in the ring. Like I said, oh, yeah. me, him, Andy, and Twisted, uh, fucking brothers, man. Oh, yeah. He's, he's been like a brother in me, too, and been good friend of the show, recommended quite a few people, and I can't think of him enough. He's actually my my two girls and my wife and I lost. He's actually honoring, 
he like he's his show is a benefit show for cancer and he's telling me he's gonna honor my little girls at his show i'm like god damn he he is he's one of the sweetest dudes ever man I, oh. I, I like i said i fucking love that guy i uh he he just did a interview with um alliance wrestling not too long ago and i watched that and uh man it's it's like i said man i i I don't have enough nice things to say about the guy. He's been there for me. He's, like I said, mate, the sweetest fucking dude. Sweetest oh, fucking dude. Love that uh, guy to death. Totally. Yeah. Next, a guy that I've seen there at your promotion, New Wave, Rocky Romero. Oh, legend. Mm. Rocky Romero is a legend. And more people need to know this. He, the first indie show I ever went to was in July of 2002. Um, and he wasn't on it, but I kind of caught wind of who he was. He was a tag team called the Los Cubanitos. Um, and they had just had to forfeit the EWF tag belts. I forget why. Probably some bullshit. <laughs> um, but it was him and Ricky Reyes. And I remember I was like, who are the Cubanitos? And I started looking into them. I was like, oh, these guys are cool. And then watching Rocky's Rise and now in the office of New Japan. Um, I want to say we booked him a couple times. Um, I, I ran cross paths with him at a couple Lucha shows. He might not remember me now, but whenever I cross paths with him, he'd be like, oh, hey, Trevor. And I'm like, how the fuck did you remember me, man? Like you're Rocky Romero and you remembered me. Like I said, now probably a totally different situation, but do legend. If there's any, that's the one word I would always tag with Rocky. Legend. Definitely. Next one, I remember I actually got to meet him after this particular show. We actually mentioned him earlier in the episode. And I was so happy when I saw him on WWE. Akira Tozawa. Yes. I only got to cross paths with him that one time at that one show. I booked him because he had just gotten off. I want to say it was that match with Chris Hero at PWG, where I think everyone was just like, holy shit, Tozawa. And so I, uh, and I, again, super fan. I watch a lot of different ones. And so I saw that and I'm like, this fool's based out of LA. I think he was in Orange County. And uh, so I reached out to, uh, I think, the guy he was staying with, uh, Martin Marin, who run, ran the WPW stuff out in uh, Anaheim. I think that's that's who I was who I booked Tozawa through. And I was just like, this guy's getting a big name right now. He was starting to get flown around. I think, like, Magnum had already flown him out. Um, he started to get more notoriety in the States. And I'm like, we're going to bring this dude in. Um, so, one, incredibly nice guy. I... He, I uh, like I said, the one inter the one night that I got to interact with him, he was super cool, super appreciative, you know. And we're bringing him in to put our champion over, and he'd never been here before, you know. <laughs> and he was super cool. We all went out afterwards, um, uh, and like a super nice guy. When he got signed, man, I was so stoked for him. Oh yeah, and he's so good. Uh, <laughs> not a fan of him in the ninja gear and chasing around the twenty four seven title. Uh, the cruiserweight Tozawa, that's what I wanted to see Ooh. more of. Yes, um, man, he's so good. That's a guy that you put him out there, he'll shine. He's so. Oh good. yeah, oh yeah, totally. Last but not least, your partner in crime there, running New Wave, <laughs> Andy Jasic, aka David E. Jones. He is a big old asshole. <laughs> No, man. Uh, again, just like SoCal, man. I, I, fucking brother. Um, it doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter that he's still out there and I had to move to Colorado. Man, he, he's he's one of the closest people. We've known each other since, what, 2006, 2005, I want to say. Um, so, you know, about 17 years, 15, 16, 17 years. And uh, we've gone through so much. We've grown up so much together. We've been through so much shit together. Um, good, bad. Uh, fuck, man. I He's one of the ones I miss seeing all the time. I saw him more than I saw my own girlfriend, now wife, you know, 
I saw him more. It was him and I every weekend. I get done with work on Friday at five o'clock, go pick up Andy and we're on to the shows for the weekend. And I'd see him Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, he's given me so much advice. Um, yeah. Fucking love that dude. I can't wait to get back to California and see him uh, and SoCal and uh, SoCal crazy. And yeah, he, you know, I was the best man at his wedding. He was in my wedding. Um, yeah. I, I fucking, I miss those guys and I can't wait to see them again. Yeah. With both uh, him and SoCal, I, I gotta say between those two, they, with the, uh, everything that happened with my little girls, they, those two helped me out more than they ever had to. So forever grateful for the both. Absolutely. And and that's, you know, with Andy, he, that was his thing. That dude's got a way with words. He's got, um, it doesn't matter what you're going through that guy has for some reasons got the right thing to say to you that you need to hear at that time. Um, and I wish I saw him more like that. He, when I moved out here, there was uh, just a handful of people that I was like, fuck, I I can't believe I'm not going to see these people all the time anymore. And, uh, you know, Andy was one of them. Um, and even when I left wrestling, like I went from seeing Andy every weekend to seeing him like maybe once every couple of months, you know, we chatted all the time and we text here and there now, and we probably text each other once or twice a week, maybe uh, definitely a lot different, but I mean, we're in totally different sections of our lives now, you know, yeah. with work, personal, all that shit. Um, but yeah, man, if, if there was somebody that if I was going through some shit and I wanted to hear the truth and i wanted to hear i needed to hear something he's the one i'd go to absolutely the way he talks the way uh, and I, I say this and i 100 percent believe this that dude is one of the best talkers wrestling mm. ever had period bar none like you watch any of our promos you see him it's up here you see me it's uh, you're not I'm not even on the screen you know <laughs> Like the way he could talk, the way he brought you in, he's got that. Like when he started telling me about all the stuff he's going to do with debate and coaching uh, kids doing debate, I'm like, fuck, that is the perfect thing for you. Like that is the perfect thing. You just, you have a way with words. You know what to say. Like me, you want me to say something? Give me a week and a lot of time to think about it (laughs) because the first thing out of my mouth is usually the wrong thing. I even did it at a meeting with my shoot job <laughs> this past week um, because it was just the first thought that came in and I said it. Andy, for some reason, has the right way of saying things, the tone, the approach, the present. If he ever, I, I, I and I, I told him this, if they just let him talk, he would have had a contract to WWE. That's all he had to do. Just send him down there to talk. He could have been a manager, something like the dude oh, yeah. just has a way with words. And he could have been a wrestler too. I'm not saying that he couldn't. Um, he, he absolutely could have. Um, yeah, man. I, those from 2007 to 2014, when we were doing Anchors Away, was some of the greatest times of my life. And whether <laughs> it got to the point where we weren't nervous about wrestling anymore. But we all we wanted to do was pop each other. So, <laughs> like, I would say random shit. He would say random shit. The our entire goal was just to try to make ourselves or our opponents laugh, either during the match, whatever. I remember there was one one time we were we had an inside joke about Jeff Hardy's little dance. No, like, yeah. why do you think he does that? Do you think he's like stretching backstage and they got those metal trusses over the stage and he smacks his hand and he's got to go as music hits. So he's like, fuck, <laughs> oh shit, that hurts. And, and he's like walking out like that. So I remember um, it was at a SoCal pro show. Uh, Jeff had the stage set up and he had the, the boards with the show with SoCal pro logos on it. We walk through and I hit my hand on the board and I'm like, ow, that fucking hurt. And he loses it right then and there. <laughs> He's like, you motherfucker. <laughs> I, and I'll, I'll say this one last thing. Uh, cause I, I've mentioned this on the podcast that I do. It was, I consider it the funniest thing I've ever done. We were wrestling in a match in Riverside for SoCal Pro. 
it might have actually been the night I met my wife, which is quite funny. Uh, we, 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 did, we, liked, we never took ourselves too seriously. I feel like as heels, you need, you, yeah, you could be badass, but you need to be vulnerable. You, need to, you can't take yourself too seriously. So we would always wear like funny underwear under our pants. We'd get our pants taken off and whatever. Well, so we, we did the match. Our pants were off. I forget what happened. He got thrown into the corner. He's sitting in the corner now. Uh, our opponent is standing in front of him. And so I come charging in and the guy sweeps my leg. I end up Bronco bustering Andy. Well, I roll back off of it and I leave my legs behind my head. So my butt is just straight up in the air. And again, we didn't take ourselves too seriously. We're very comfortable in some uncomfortable situations. So he decides to lean forward onto my ass. Face right in my ass. At that moment, I had one brewing. Oh, God. And I push it out. <laughs> His nose is square, like. <laughs> and I knew what was about to happen. Oh, I push it out, and it wasn't loud. He just felt the vibration. <laughs> he, like, again, we're supposed to be selling down at this point. Like, this was a part where we needed just to be kind of dead. We, you know, whatever. He pushes me away. I'm now laying on my stomach. You see me convulsing with laughter. This guy is in my ear going, you motherfucker, I'm going to fucking kill you. Like, not loud, but just enough to where I can hear it, right in my ear. And he is just berating me in my ear. And I am crying with laughter. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, that, that was... I find that to be the funniest thing I did in wrestling. And it only was between him and I. Nobody else knew. Nobody but that's, else but that's the best part about what we tried to do. We tried to pull shit like that just to make each other laugh, have a little fun with it. Um, and we would call random shit to people just to get a reaction. Uh, but that one, I will never forget it. Uh, is it the most immature thing I've ever done? Absolutely. Uh, could I have given him pink eye? Yeah. <laughs> but once he leaned in and I was like, Oh my God, this is happening. I'm doing this. Uh, yeah, I had to do it. And I even said to him later, I was like, motherfucker, you would have done the same thing to me. In the, if the roles were reversed, you would. And he's, that's when he finally was like, yeah. And he thought it was funny at that point. But that's, that's what we tried to do to each other during the matches. Um, another one was we re ribbed him. It was like a 10 man tag at EWF. And, uh, we were planning out the finishes and they were like, well, why don't, why don't the five babies hit a finish on one guy? Each of them hit their singles finish on one guy. And Andy's like, yeah, I'll do it. And, but then he looks up and goes, but I don't want to be tagged in, in between taking the finish, or the, the opening of the match and the finish. Since I'm taking all those bumps, let me just rest during the match. Well, one of the guys, his name, uh, he wrestled under the name Roger Ruiz, uh, RJ's his name. Him and I locked eyes. No, and he was on the opposite. I want no, was he on our team? He was on our team. And him and I locked eyes. No words were said. We just went, we just locked eyes, nodded. Opening match happens. Opening of the match happens. Andy tags out. And we clued everybody else in. Somebody else comes in, does something, tags in Andy. Andy's like, man, I said I want to stay up till the end. Gets in, does something, tags me in. I go in, I do like one thing, I tag Andy back in and he goes, what are you doing? And I said, what man? And he goes, and he's just like nothing. And he gets in the ring, does something, tags out somebody else. They do something, tag right back to Andy. And Andy, Andy very loudly goes, I know what's going on here. <laughs> the whole match, he kept getting brought in. He was fuming. <laughs> And, and the rest of us, and he was even in the ring at once. He just gave us like the fucking stare. And we all put our heads down, just crying with laughter. <laughs> we just love fucking with him because he got so mad. Um, but yeah, that, that, was, that was the second best thing I think we ever did to him. Um, oh, man. I, I, I fuck, yeah, that, those, were, those were the good old days. But that's what I love doing with him is just 
making other people laugh and trying to make people laugh. I didn't care if I made somebody laugh because I fell on my face. Uh, I, I didn't give a shit. I, like I said, I didn't try to take myself too seriously and neither did he. Uh, and I think that's why we were able to kind of try and pop each other. Uh, mm. But yeah, those are my two favorite, like with Andy, trying to just fucking with Andy uh, stories. Oh man. I think maybe that's why I get along with you two so well, because that's what I do at all the shows that I go to. <laughs> it's, it's, at, at some point in the show, it is my goal to get somebody, whether it's a wrestler, ref, yep. crew member, commentary, somebody to crack. And more often than not, I can, I've had it done before the first bell even started. <laughs> and I remember one time, a guy that I've had on the show, he heel uh, a heel manager, and he, one time I I forget what I said to him, but he was at a corner near where I was, and I could see him like kind of <laughs> try to hold it in, and then at, right as he walks by me, I just point out and just yell, "I made you laugh." <laughs> out laughing. and then later on he's on the opposite side of the ring i got him twice in, <laughs> in the same match. he i said something but then he ends up thinking like i guess somebody behind him said it and it was like oh thank you and i just it was a little pause in the crowd noise i just yell out that was me <laughs> you know what man you gotta be able to have fun in those situations i, I remember andy and i went to a, an indie show and this was before anyone knew who the hell we were and i don't mean it like anyone really knew who the hell we were but no one in the scene really knew who we were and i remember we just went there to watch and you know they do the whole clapping <laughs> thing to try and really get a pump up and I remember the guy's got the crowd to clap. We're all clapping. And then he does something, but gets cut off right away. And he's back down on the floor. And Andy just screams. And it got quiet right when he got cut off. And Andy just screams, what are you doing? We clapped for you. <laughs> the audience laughed. You could see the guy in the ring laughing. Like, he broke everybody. The ref, it was, it was awesome. My, he, favorite, <laughs> my favorite one that I did was actually at an NXT house show. Oh. I want to say the guy is now going. I might be wrong, but I'm wanting to say NXT. He had kind of like a fitness gimmick, had a water bottle with him. I think he's now Madcap Moss. Okay. And, you know, one time, well, this happened, two different things happened in that match. One time he's getting his water, and I just, I literally get the whole crowd going. Water sucks. It really, really sucks. <laughs> and then he's in he's in a headlock with the, the guy, and I go, Gatorade's better. And he just looks at me like you mother. <laughs> I'll be, house shows are my favorite, man. Those are oh. indie shows, house shows. Like the, just the closeness you can get to people, and <laughs> I, I I love it, man. Those are those are those are my favorite. Like oh, yeah. that that to me is pro wrestling. Oh yeah, I'm gonna be having fun with that Saturday. That <laughs> nice. Saturday oh God, I'm gonna. I have some ammo ready. Nice. <laughs> but uh, last but not least. I used to call this the speed round, but to be quite honest, it never went that quickly. So I changed it to just a random question round. I was about to say, if you want speed with me, I talk. So, uh. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> I was like, you know what? After the amount of times that the round never went that quick, I'm like, you know what? Random question round. We'll just call it that. Some questions might be wrestling related. Some might okay. not. Okay. We, I think we might have... Th one match that we might have talked about might fit this craziest in match moment. Ooh. Of what? Just anything I saw? Well, anything that you were in. Anything I was in. Oh my gosh. Craziest mid match moment. 
Oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank on this one. Oh. Wow. Uh, like I'm just trying, I'm going back. I'm like, oh man, what? Andy likes to talk shit. <laughs> this was our first time in Mexico. Oh in boy. And we came out talking a lot of shit. And the the venue wasn't like something with a ton of security. I don't even think there was security. And we're talking a bunch of shit. And I want to say we were even the first match. Crowd's booing us, whatever. This fan in the front row stands up. And he just and, and we're both standing there. And he looks right at Andy and goes, You're on the wrong side of the border, homie. And uh I look at Andy, he looks at me, and I'm just like, oh, shit's about to hit the fan. The ring, which for some reason was some ungodly height, like, I want to say, like, just to get up on the ring, like, the apron of the ring came up to here on me. Like, very (laughs) weird. And I'm like, all right, this motherfucker's jumping. I'm going to get in the ring, so he has to come up to us. And I go, Andy, get up in the ring now. And I get up on the ring, and he looks at me, and he goes, it's okay. I got this. I'm going to, he's like, I got this. I'm like, you sure? He goes, I got this. Turns back around, gets right in the fan's face and goes, fuck your mother. And I'm just like, oh shit, here we go. And, and Andy like bolts it into the ring. And I'm already, I was on the apron at this point and I get in the ring. I'm like this motherfucker. And the, the guy didn't jump the rail. I was full on expecting this dude to pull out a knife, something. And I'm just like, and Andy's looking at me. And I'm just like, you thought to calm this situation down, you were going to tell him to fuck your mother. <laughs> okay. And he's, he's cracking up at me and I'm sitting here going, we're in TJ. This is a not very well protected show. There's no security. There's a guardrail. That's it. Yeah. I was expecting shit. So it wasn't crazy in like the outcome, <laughs> but like in terms of in my head going, what the fuck's about to happen? I legit thought we were about to have a brawl. And the dude the dude was fuming. Like, you look at him, he's mad. He's pissed. We get done with our match. We go, we get changed, we get our shit, and we run out. Like, the only way out to where our car was was through the crowd. And we grab our shit and run out the fucking building. Because he's sitting there going, uh, this guy's probably waiting for us, by the way. And I'm like, nope. And our significant others at the time were sitting like a few rows behind this guy. And we're like, we got to get them and get out. You know, we got to fucking hurry. And this was 2007. Like there, we didn't have iPhones and shit. I don't even think I was texting at this, texting people at this point. They were still charging you to text people. And I, I like, fuck this. But yeah, man, craziest in terms of what could have happened. Yeah. That one. I, it would be hard to top that, I'd imagine. <laughs> but uh, next one, talked a little bit about our collections. What is the most you've paid for an item? <laughs> uh, well, belts are pretty expensive. Oh, yeah. Um, probably the AEW belt. That one or the IWGP one, the heavyweight mm-hmm. title um, for... Uh, for that, uh, for an action figure, I may have just dropped a hundred bucks on one. Um, and that was, I wanted the chase Ricky Starks, um, where he's in Darby gear. Oh, that, that is a good one. Uh, I, I haven't found it in the wild. Uh, so I found someone who had it and he didn't want eBay price for it. And he's like, make me an offer. And I'm, I mean, eBay's were going for 250 and I said 125 and he sent it to me. And <laughs> yeah, uh, that's probably the most I've paid for a single action figure. Most I've paid for anything in my collection is probably those uh, Alex Colon kick pads because he was, sure. get, he was getting ready to invest in some new ones. And I said, well, how much do you want for those? And he said, make me an offer. So I said, uh, I don't want to lowball you. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, 100 bucks. He was like, they're yours. 
Sweet. That and probably that 30th anniversary uh, Super Shredder that I have. Oh, that one's sick. Yeah. That was about, and that wasn't even that much. That was probably about 50, 60. That's still a lot for a single figure, though. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. definitely. But uh, next one, favorite movie. Ooh. Well, you can't see it because of my camera, but I'll pan up a little bit. Let's see if you could uh, just move this, and let's see if I could pan that up. Ah. For when my wife and I got married, uh, that was the gift she gave me for when we got married. It was signed signed Top Gun poster by the entire cast. Nice. Um, I know cinematically, is it the greatest movie? No, but it was the first movie I remember seeing in movie theaters. I was three years old. Uh, and yeah, Top Gun. Um, Top Gun's my favorite. I put, you know, the Star Wars stuff up there too. Yeah, that, that those are up there for me too. I still think one for me that, good Lord, I've lost count of how many times I've watched it. <laughs> I remember when I worked with youth and they had a movie day one time and they were watching it. I came in and I just started quoting the movie line for line right along with them. Sometimes in the Forrest Gump voice, but Forrest Gump. That's a great movie. Oh That's God. I've lost, movie. I've lost kind of how many damn times. <laughs> I've, like, I've, I've seen it so many times that when I've been to Bubba Gump shrimp restaurants, and the tr the servers ask you trivia questions about the movie. I can answer their questions before they're done asking them. <laughs> what a mark! <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not I'm not even going to deny that one. Exactly. <laughs> but, uh, last but not least, best advice for anybody wanting to get into wrestling. Ooh. All right, I got a couple things. Um, this one, well, one of them is not is wrestling advice. The other one's just general life advice that I use to this day. Um, the wrestling advice always is uh, don't show up to wrestling training thinking you know everything. Mm. You know nothing. You know absolutely nothing. Watching wrestling and doing wrestling is two totally different things. Um, I can't tell you how many times I watched kids come in just to watch a training class because they want to start and they're sitting there telling me everything they want to do, the moves they want to do this and that. And I'm just like, buddy, you don't even know if you know how to, if you could run the ropes, like <laughs> you need to be pretty coordinated for wrestling. Uh, yeah. so my, mine is you don't know anything. So when you show up, mouth shut, ears open, mm. um, general life advice. I got this when I was 19 years old from a stripper. The answer is always no, if you don't ask the question. I remember I was sitting at a strip club. I wasn't in the front row paying. And I actually just told the story to my wife not too long ago. I, I ran out of money. And Badger, the guy I do the podcast with, guess who I was with? Um, he took, I, I want to say this is probably like my first one I ever went to too. And I, so I wasn't sitting front row, but I knew that he told me the etiquette. And the lady walks up and it was just like, oh, why aren't you sitting front row? And I was like, I don't have cash to tip. So I, he does. So I'm just waiting for him. And she goes, so uh, I assume that means no on a dance. I'm like, yeah, no, sorry. And she goes, well, well the answer is always no if you don't ask the question. And I'm just sitting there like it. And I didn't really click at the time, but I remember like, a, uh, like leaving. And I remember telling my buddy, I'm like, yeah, this is what she said to me. And he just looks and he goes, that's fucking deep. <laughs> you don't expect to hear that at a strip club. Oh, definitely um, not. Yeah. But that is something I've taken with me for 20 years. I use it even to this day. I even said that I used that in a corporate meeting not too long ago. I didn't give them the backstory of it, but I mm. used it as a corporate in a corporate meeting because someone's like, oh, oh no, we don't I don't do that. And I was like, yeah, all good. I had to ask. And they're like, Well, did you know the answer was gonna be no? I said, No, but if I didn't ask the question, it was gonna be no. And they're just like, Oh, makes sense. Like I said, that's one of my life philosophies. The answer is always no if you don't ask the question. You know what? That is actually good advice and something I've actually used in trying to reach out to people for the show. Some of them that I'm like, you know what? This is probably going to be a long shot, but I'll never know the answer if I don't ask. 
when you so, were talking about Kerry Silken, that phrase popped in my head. I was going to say, yeah. We, and like, good Lord, some of the people that, like he was one of the first ones that it definitely jumped into my head. Like, man, this is going to be a long shot, but you know what? Gotta ask. Heck with it. Yeah. Just ask. What's the worst they're going to say? No. Yep. I've, and you know what? To be honest, I haven't actually been turned down all that often. I've either, I, it has happened, but more often than not, I just don't hear back from somebody. Right. <laughs> but it's whatever. I but, got ghosted by Kevin Steen when I tried to book him once. <laughs> but I had, and I'd got his contact info from um, Eva Luno. Eva Luno had given me his contact info because uh, he had just done a stint in SoCal and him and I had connected. And so we started chatting over, uh, over AOL Instant Messenger, of all things. Um, <laughs> and so I mentioned about Kevin was coming to PWG and he goes, oh, here's his contact info. Uh, let him know, I, I, you know that you got it from me. And so I didn't, he ghosted me. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, it happens. Yeah. But that is about all I have for tonight. Awesome, One. man want to take the time to thank you for taking the time to talk to me oh, and man, I appreciate it to, where can people find you you know you said you got that podcast why don't we you know whenever you guys get back into that people can get an eye on that yeah unfortunately uh badger had some uh, knee surgery and had some complications from it so <laughs> we couldn't record for a bit then we brought back an episode where i think we we shit all over cm punk and then uh, we went on hiatus again because I got sick, my family got sick, and then as things got better, oh, I'm getting a new job. So my life's been kind of pretty busy. But our podcast is on YouTube. We call it Play Fighting. A um, little bit insulting to the wrestling business, but I find it funny, you know. And the, my buddy's the one who came up with the name, and he's like, "I heard Al Snow call wrestling Play Fighting," and I was like, "I'm good with it. If Al Snow called it that, I'm good with it." Um, Oh, yeah. You can find us on YouTube on, under the Play Fighting Podcast. You can find me on Twitter at Ryan Stone SD. Um, everything else, I'm kind of, I keep kind of private. That's my personal stuff. And it's funny, I'm pretty sure you and I were friends on Facebook back in the day. And I'm going to be honest, I deleted you. When I got out of <laughs> wrestling, when I got out of wrestling, if I didn't have any personal relationship with people, I got rid of you. You know, no. at the time it was like, listen, these people know me as Ryan Stone not Trevor. The, if you yeah. don't know me as Trevor, I'm not keeping you on my page. And that's the way it was. I didn't know you at the time. Uh, and that's why it was, that's why I deleted you, but we, we recently reconnected and man, I, I'm so appreciative. Thank you so much for asking me. I, I, I love your stuff, man. I love chatting with you. And uh, yeah, thank you. I had a blast. You're very welcome. And you know, we'll, uh, you're welcome back anytime. Definitely. Appreciate it, man. Really but yeah, that, like I said, that is about all I have. And, you know, hope you have a good uh, rest of your night. I know my dogs are looking like they're wanting to get get outside. My, my wife's waiting for me upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all good. She knew about it. Ah, yeah. <laughs> do, do, do.